I want to thank the uh, organizing committee members for allowing me to substitute for Roy Martin. He originally was going to give this presentation, but for health reasons is unable. I, I'm going to mention something about him in, in, the, in a couple of slides. So I'm presenting review of dietary resistant starch mechanisms mainly from animal uh, models. And uh, these are disclosures. So uh, our group has been funded by Ingredion Incorporated. Previously, they were known as National Starch, and we've had funding. And uh, so what, uh, to eliminate bias, well, what I'm presenting is our research and other uh, lab groups research that has been published for the most part. I am presenting a couple new things that are, uh, that are unpublished. Um, and we've also received funding from federal agencies at very rigorous uh, review process. And just to mention Roy, Roy and I have, uh, he, Roy used to be at uh, Louisiana State University with me years ago. He's now at uh, UC Davis at the USDA Center. We still collaborate, but he's having some health problems. He's uh, hoping that his sister will be able to uh, donate a kidney, and they're evaluating her health to be able to do that. And then he expects to look 20 years younger, he says, when he gets a new kidney. All right, so today uh, I'm going to be talking about a few things. First of all, some of the exciting uh, times we're in doing research with uh, resistant starch and other fermentable fibers. So resistant starch isn't the only one. It, you know, fermentable fiber, very important. Uh, then talk about what is resistant starch. Then how, how did we begin doing resistant starch uh, research? How research? Is resistant starch effective in humans? Just mentioning that, and then Denise Robertson is going to talk more about that next. Uh, then talk about beyond energy dilution, you know, into the, the fermentation effects. And then uh, mention of some things where uh, models where resistant starch has not been effective in making uh, phenotypic or physiological changes. And then summarize. So first of all, excitement about research. Uh, I'm actually more excited than ever about uh, resistant starch and other fermentable fiber research. Um, the research that's grown with the microbiota in the last 10 or so, 15 years, and omics, the measurement of so many metabolites and, and other, other types of chemicals, uh, has led to uh, knowing many reasons for the benefits of fermentable fibers. And I, I even use, uh, anecdotally, I, I use it, I have a short bowel, and I use it to produce uh, more uh, GLP-2 naturally that increases absorption. Uh, about 15 years ago, the, the main focus for fermentable fibers seemed to be on GLP-1 and PYY. And PYY is peptide YY, glucagon-like peptide 1 is GLP-1. And they're uh, shown to reduce hunger, increase metabolic activity, and improve insulin sensitivity. And a lot of, uh, and, and probably the major focus has been GLP-1 because it's called an incretin hormone because it enhances the insulin effect. And then on this slide, uh, what you can see is, what, what you have is you have a, a proglucagon gene that results in the GLP-1 and GLP-2. And... Uh, then it, you produce proglucagon messenger RNA and then a proglucagon peptide. And then post-translational modification in the pancreas and the alpha cells produce glucagon and a couple other small things, but mainly glucagon. And in the intestine and brain, you produce GLP-1, GLP-2, and oxyntomodulin. Okay. And, but, you know, the, that's not the only answer, the, the GLP-1 and the PYY. Uh, Short-chain fatty acids directly. At first they thought, well, most of them would be taken up by the epithelial cells. Maybe none will reach past the liver and into the systemic circulation. Um, but they actually get past there. But uh, there is some work Denise Robertson's done with the GLP-1 uh, with resistant starch and GLP-1 not increasing. But you can see here that... Oh, uh, did the wrong thing. What you see here is the short-chain fatty acids can have a direct effect on the liver reducing gluconeogenesis. And so even without uh, stimulation of uh, GLP-1, you can still have some uh, improved glucose control. So that's interesting. And then the main three uh, short-chain fatty acids are acetate, which is two carbons, propionate, three carbons, and butyrate, four. 
There's many, there's several others, and there's many metabolites, but those are your three main short chain fatty acids. And so short chain fatty acids have been shown uh, to bind to receptors of immune cells and, and regulate the immune system. And uh, a recent talk that I saw at Experimental Biology, and then I, I looked up the paper, is that uh, blood pressure can be regulated by short chain fatty acids. And you have, you have two different receptors, the GPR41 and the OLFFR78, that uh, at different levels of propionate uh, become active. Uh, and that helps to increase or decrease blood pressure. And propionate seems to be the, uh, a, the key uh, short chain fatty acid for the blood pressure regulation. <laughs> and then the production of uh, derivatives of bile acids by uh, the microbiota, the bacteria in the gut, uh, uh, appear to bind to, uh, again, uh, receptors in, in the immune system and regulate, and regulate the immune system. And, just, uh, and also experimental biology, back in the spring, uh, Randy Seeley presented data about vertical sleeve gastrectomy. It shows here where they cut uh, uh, the back portion of the stomach and you just have this uh, sleeve, they call it. And what happened, they saw that you, with those patients, they increase bile acid absorption and they bind to FXR. And uh, another name for that is BAR, bile acid receptor. And it prevents uh, obesity even on a high-fat diet. And they've done work with uh, uh, mice and shown that uh, with a, a vertical sleeve gastrectomy, they're uh, resistant to high-fat diet-induced obesity. And so the signaling through that receptor uh, via bile acids and probably metabolites of bile acids, uh, that's exciting. And then uh, dendritic cells that are part of the immune system actually can sense uh, the bacteria and metabolites of the bacteria products um, uh, you know, from the lumen of the intestine. So a lot of interaction and, and uh, you know, the, the, so these fermentation products uh, can affect the host uh, organism's health. And then this was done in Zucker diabetic fatty rats, and uh, uh, we fed four diets. And uh, this one here is a whole grain flour high RS. This is a purified resistant starch, just a starch. This is a whole grain with low RS. It's the flour. And then this is a purified control. And what's exciting, see, Ferulic acid was increased, and it's a polyphenol derivative, and a very important antioxidant. And it's the amount was vastly increased with whole grain, but especially vastly increased with high RS. Now, so I did a little introduction about some of the things I think are exciting. And now, what is resistant starch? Well, structurally, starch comes in two, pri two primary forms, amylose, which is a straight chain, and amylopectin with, with branches. Uh, and generally, amylose is resistant to digestion because the terminal units of the straight chain, the ends, uh, fold into starch granules that don't allow the amylase enzyme to uh, uh, digest it. And one way to view resistant starch is defined as uh, what reaches the large intestine is fermented to short-chain fatty acids and, as I mentioned, probably many other products. And there's four types of resistant starch, RS1, basically whole grains, defines that just structure of the whole grains make uh, inaccessible to the en amylase enzyme. And we've used, as I showed in that slide, the high 260 whole grain flour, whole grain flour. And then RS2, uh, best, one of the best examples, high amylose cornstarch, and we've used the purified uh, cornstarch. And then RS3 is retrograded, and the be best example is cooked potatoes that are then cooled for potato salad, and you get the retrograded the RS3. And RS4 is if it's been chemically modified where the uh, chains are, are linked or you add substituent groups to the, to the uh, starch. Uh, another way to look at it, is the in vitro uh, digestibility and if, with the um, enzyme mix. And, and if it's digested within 20 minutes, it's rapidly digestible starch. 
Uh, slowly digestible starch is digested between 20 and 120 minutes, and then resistant is greater than 120 minutes, and based on the English assay, who's done a lot of work in uh, discovery of resistant starches. And then uh, this is an interesting slide. Um, uh, Chris Palkman of Ingredient was concerned we were using in a pilot human study uh, yogurt as a vehicle for the RS2 uh, resistant starch. And with pasteurization of the yogurt, thought maybe uh, we'd lose the starch granules. But uh, fortunately, the uh, person that was making the yogurt, the dairy person, didn't use the short time, high temp pasteurization. He used the low temperature, lower temperature, you know, the allowable lower temperature at a longer time. And you can see that the starch granules dispersed throughout the yogurt are still intact, which we were very happy to see that. Now, how did we begin doing resistant starch research? Uh, well, Roy Martin was at uh, Experimental Biology, I don't know, probably about 2001, maybe. And Jennifer Brand Miller was uh, presenting a glycemic index study and how the body fat was reduced in rodents, in rodent study. And uh, so we were going to do some research. And Marin Hegstead, who used to work with us, um, contacted Dr. Brand Miller, and she told us she used resistant starch to produce her low glycemic index diets. And you know, we thought, oh, maybe there's some controversy with glycemic index. I know the next, se next session is talking about it, so maybe it's not controversial. As we thought it was a little controversial, so we said, let's do resistant starch research. So what we did, we did what uh, Dr. Brand Miller did, and we replaced the high amylopectin starch in the rodent diets uh, with high amylose starch. And generally, we use about 25% of the weight of the diet as resistant starch. Now, when we began doing these studies, we didn't know the, uh, the metabolizable energy value of the resistant starch product. And uh, we did some studies and got very dramatic results. So this slide shows you know, several different amounts and at 32% of the weight of the diet, quite a bit, in Sprague Dolly rats, male, 12 weeks of study, we had a 61% reduction in abdominal fat. Okay? So that, that's very impressive. And I'm gonna, but that's a lot of resistant starch. You know, a lot of people replacing the, star, the, the uh, highly digestible starch. But so I want to mention briefly, would this be effective in humans? And so, Anthony Bird's group uh, showed that body fat in, in uh, obese-prone and obese-resistant Sprague Dolly rats was reduced, significantly reduced, at 8% of the weight of the diet. However, they were doing both energy dilution and fermentation effects, because when you add resistant starch, uh, you're going to dilute the energy and you'll, you'll get fermentation. Um, but it, it, they didn't use isocaloric diet, control diet. Um, George Fahey of the University of Illinois has talked to me quite a bit, and we, he, he says he's calculated roughly that about 10% of the weight of the diet is equivalent, roughly equivalent to the human fiber requirement. So if humans meet their fiber requirement with a good amount of fermentable fiber, maybe, maybe they'll be able to reduce body fat. But when you look at the literature, on human studies, and I, I found a good review in Advances, uh, Advances in Nutrition, uh, Dr. Diane Burke of, Bird of Iowa State, she basically states that more long-term studies with resistant starch in humans are needed. There's just to see if there is reduced body fat, body weight, and increased fat oxidation. So that's wide open to be able to show, if you can show that. Uh, Dr. Denise Robertson has done some very uh, nice studies in humans with uh, one study with 30 grams per day of resistant starch and one with 40 and saw improved insulin sensitivity. However, it's interesting that, and I mentioned it earlier, that she doesn't see increased GLP-1 for the treated group. And at first I thought, well, what's, what's going on? No GLP-1, what's, how could that be going on? And what we found is there's a nice review at our article by Jin et al. in 2008 that talks about uh, a transcription factor that interacts with the promoter region of the proglucagon gene for production of GLP-1 and GLP-2. And uh, if it's defective, 
um, then you produce low or no GLP-1. Um, and, and having that allele uh, is associated with type 2 diabetes. And so this demonstrates that increased production of GLP-1 uh, appears not to be required for improved insulin sensitivity with consumption of resistant starch. So other things like short-chain fatty acids and other metabolites would be having that effect, would be part of the mechanism. Now, we did, we did a study recently published um, that where we used citagliptin, which is a DPP-4 inhibitor, and DPP-4 enzyme degrades GLP-1 active to inactive form. And we combined it with resistant starch, both to see you know, greater effects on GLP-1 production. And what, what we found was in the, we used GLP-1 receptor knockout in wild-type uh, mice. And the wild-type mice had better fasting glucose with the resistant starch citagliptin combination. And they had reduced abdo abdominal fat. However, the GLP-1 receptor knockout mice, no effect on the fasting glucose no effect on the abdominal fat mass, but they had very high GLP-1 GLP to try and overcome not having the receptor. And uh, so it looks like we, we hypothesized from this that maybe you don't need increased GLP-1, but to uh, uh, have it, you know, improved insulin sensitivity, glucose control, you may at least need the GLP-1 receptor. And then another thing that's important is you probably you need to be able to ferment resistant starch to have the greatest effect. And this is work from Jens Walter's group and uh, show that there was one subject who used RS4 and RS2 and for all the subjects. And these X's means no, no bacteria produced. And if it's a small circle, le you know, less. And compared to other subjects, they appear not to ferment because they're not producing uh, the same amount of uh, types of bacteria in the microbiota. All right, so now get into a little bit more of our research on beyond energy dilution. And so uh, important, we think, to use isochloric diets to study fermentation effects. So we wanted to go beyond just having energy dilution because you can use any fiber. You could grind up plastic beads. Peterson and Baumgart did that work in the 70s. And you dilute dietary energy, and that's important. But we wanted to study fermentation without energy dilution. And so what we had to do first, we had to fig determine, we used bomb calorimetry, and we teamed up with another group in the publication, did another method. But we, we, our group used bomb calorimetry to figure out the energy value of the uh, high maze 260 product, 2.8 kilocalories per gram. This allowed us to do isochloric diet studies and perform mechanistic proof of concept studies on fermentation effects. And so this, this slide shows three different studies um, that, that show the effect of fermentation reducing body fat. The black slides, the black bars are resistant starch, and the white bars are the isochloric control or EC energy control. So this is not an effect of energy dilution as a result of just fermentation. And then um, what we have here is that this was, in, this was in black six mice, and we see that with the resistant starch, again, the black bars, we have a reduced respiratory quotient, which means the lower it is, the more fat burning. So fat burning is increasing. Uh, we have uh, significant oxygen consumption in the dark cycle, and it's almost significant at 0.07 in the 24 hours, and then heat production, almost significant 0.07 for dark and uh, and then, and then this just shows, this slide just shows short chain fatty acids producing the PYY and GLP-1, and they affect uh, uh, neurons in the brain that, that affect energy expenditure and food intake. And then a graduate student measured the pro the POMC uh, gene expression in arcuate nucleus hypothalamus, and it significantly increased, so that's probably why the energy expenditure. And then we, NPY and AGRP gene expression were increased, not significantly, but that's maybe why we don't see reduced food intake with resistant starch. We actually see a little more. And then we've, we've got a couple animal models, the endocrine obesity, ovariectomized, and sham had reduced uh, uh, abdominal fat to body weight percent. Uh, we hit show improved uh, home IR uh, with uh, 
go to Kakazaki lean model type of type 2 diabetes. And here we show just short chain fatty acids increase that I talked about earlier. And then this slide shows that we, we show, what we did was measure GLP-1 and PYY over 24 hours, and it was increased at all points. And this may explain why we're not seeing a satiety effect, because you don't see the meal effects, because they're always fermenting, and they're they have these high, high levels of the hormone. One, when re resistant starch is not effective, this is Zucker diabetic fatty rats I mentioned earlier. And what you see on this slide, several graphs just showing that fermentation was very robust. Whole grain flour with high resistant starch was fermented better than the purified. But we saw no difference in abdominal fat percent. Uh, but we may see some insulin sensitivity. My graduate student, to get normalization of data, threw out very low, uh, val two low values here and one here, so we could do normal statistics. And you see the mean comparison shows a difference, but the overall ANOVA was 0.08. So there may be some improvement in insulin sensitivity. And this just shows the microbiota very quickly. And you see the, the, uh, the high, the high resistant starch is here and separates from the low resistant starch along the x axis. And then the whole grain separates uh, along the y axis from the purified starch. And this is just all the bands for the four groups. Here's the high RS whole grain. And you see uh, the whole grain low RS has very high lactobacillus that's decreased in the high RS. And then this, this just shows that there's, uh, we used uh, uh, obese, polygenic obese mice that didn't ferment, and they had no, no response as far as body fat. We used a moderate and low-fat diets, no insulin resistance differences. And then from the pH uh, values, uh, they appear not to ferment. We didn't compare them uh, for pH to the black six because the, uh, a student ran some uh, uh, cultures and showed that low and moderate fat had equivalent bacteria. That's lactobacillus there as an example. And in summary, so fermentation of resistant starch at proof of concept dietary amounts promotes benefits of resistant starch consumption. Fermentation and dietary energy dilution combination of resistant starch may promote reduction of body fat in humans, but there are no conclusive human studies at this time. Uh, fermentation of resistant starch at 30 to 40 grams per day improves insulin sensitivity in humans, but increased serum GLP-1 appears not to be necessary. Use of GLP-1 receptor knockout mice indicate the receptor is important for reduced body fat and possibly insulin sensitivity. A functional leptin receptor uh, is necessary to reduce body fat even with robust fermentation like in ZDF rats and distinct microbiota changes, but they not, may not be necessary to improve the insulin sensitivity. If diets are isocaloric, lack of fermentation appears to limit the effects of resistant starch on body fat and insulin sensitivity and polygenic obesity. And lastly, research with short-chain fatty acids and omics is exciting, and numerous products of fermentation of resistant starch uh, by the microbiota should lead to more understanding of mechanism in the future and just shows people have worked with us. I want to thank Chris Pelkman of Ingredion, and then before her, Ann Burkett and Ian Brown when it was National Star. Thank you.